Holy Father, uh, this morning as we uh, open Your Word and uh, we go back to a really familiar story, pray, Lord, that You would speak to each of us in new ways today. Thank You for Jared and his story, Lord, the way You called him to Yourself, woke him up, brought him home. Some of us are running today, Lord. Help us to wake up. Uh, call us back home. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In 1666, the University of Cambridge in England was closed due to a plague. So 23-year-old physicist, mathematician, Cambridge student, um, Isaac Newton retreated to his family's estate in Lincolnshire. While there, he saw an apple fall from a tree. The legend has it it hit him on his head. I don't think it did. But as he watched that apple fall to the ground, it inspired him to develop the theory of universal gravitation. He didn't invent gravity. He really didn't discover it. But he was the first to describe it mathematically. That apple falling from the tree was his aha moment. In 1907, Albert Einstein was a 28-year-old clerk in the patent office of Bern, Switzerland, when by his own account, a breakthrough came suddenly one day. Instead of keeping his mind on his work, his thoughts wandered. He began to wonder, if a man falls freely, would he be able to feel his own weight? And that thought occupied his mind. And he, he says, I was taken aback. This simple thought experiment made a deep impression on me. Took him eight more years to develop his masterwork, the general theory of relativity, you know, E equals MC squared. Uh, but the concept was born that day as his mind wandered at work. That was his aha moment. At the age of 22, Nick Woodman gave himself until the age of 30 to make it as an entrepreneur and businessman. Four years later, one field failed business later, he decided to take his savings and go on a five-month surfing trip around Australia and Indonesia for inspiration. While he was preparing for the trip, he thought to himself that it would be neat if he could take pictures of himself while he surfed. And so he decided he went to work on a camera and rigged up a camera he could put on his wrist that would be strong enough to withstand the, the water and the surfing. The GoPro camera was born. Aha! Today, Nick Woodman is a millionaire many times over. Aha! It's defined as a moment of sudden insight or discovery. It's the moment that things become clear. It is, as we say, when the light bulb comes on. We're starting a new series today, a series that's going to take us through Easter called Aha! It's based on a book and video study of the same name by Kyle Eidelman. And the idea is that there are aha experiences in the Christian life. There are times of supernatural change when it becomes clear that the path we're walking down needs to change. Eidelman defines Christian aha like this. He calls it a sudden recognition that leads to an honest moment that brings lasting change. And he notes there are three critical components to an AHA experience, which conveniently form the acronym AHA. Those three components are a sudden awakening, brutal honesty, and immediate action. Awakening, honesty, action. AHA. And to get at this idea, over the next seven weeks, we're going to focus on one story in the Bible. It's probably the best, most well-known of Jesus' parables. It's a story that Charles Dickens calls the greatest story, short story ever told. It's found in Luke 15. You know it, we know it as the story of the prodigal son. So let me read it. Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. 
And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. He began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food enough to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come, the servant replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him safe and sound. And the older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and every, everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. This is, of course, a great story. We're going to look at it from a lot of different angles over the course of the next seven weeks or so. But today, we start at the beginning. Every story has a beginning. There has to be a once upon a time. See if, here, let's see if you can recognize the story from these beginnings. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I know. How about this? The Marleys were dead to begin with. A little harder. Christmas Carol, the Marleys. Too. And this one, you know, another Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Tale of Two Cities, right? So here's the beginning of Jesus' story. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. The story begins at home. The father's house. There's a man and he has two sons. We don't know if there's a mom. She doesn't get mentioned in the story. Perhaps um, she's gone. Uh, the, Jesus focuses, the, the main characters here, the action in the story revolves around his father and his relationship to his two boys. Clearly, in the parable, the father represents God. And we, the listeners, we're supposed to see ourselves in one or the other, or maybe both, of the two sons. We don't get a lot of details about what life is like in the father's house, but we can make a few assumptions Obviously, the father is not poor. He has enough wealth for the younger son to want it. We know from the end of the story that there are servants and there are fields to be worked, robes and sandals. There's a fattened calf, which tells you, you know, this is a higher class family, and a higher income family. Peasants in that day would not have fattened calves on the property. And it would appear that the father loved both of his boys very much. I mean, that sort of comes across throughout the story. 
And at the same time, you get the impression that these boys were not spoiled. At the end of the story, the older brother comes in from working in the fields. He says, I've always obeyed you, father. So, so clearly the father does have some rules. He has some expectations. He expects his sons to do their part. All in all, it would seem that the father's house was a good place to be. And yet there's something in the younger son that makes him want to leave. No matter how good it is, no matter how well provided for he is, no matter how much his family loves him, he wants to go. When the son asks his father for his share of the inheritance, he is effectively saying, Dad, I wish you dead. He's saying that the money is more important to him than his father is. It's a terrible insult. That would be a terrible insult today in that culture in which a father would have the right to beat his son for insulting him in such a way. You can imagine how this could have gone over. The father in this story has every right to take his son and throw him out on his ear. But that's not what he does. At this point, I'm guessing the father must have felt like he'd lost his son already. And so in a desperate attempt to maintain some type of relationship, he does what the boy asks. He divides up his inheritance. He divides up what he owns. The older son would have been entitled to two-thirds. The younger son gets a third, makes it available to him. The son takes it, and he leaves. And of course, you know this is more than just a fictional story, right? That the, the father in this story represents God. And in the younger son, Jesus is painting a portrait of all of us. Because we have a tendency to want to leave home. We wander away from the father. We tell him far too often that we'd rather have his stuff than him. And so we're going to focus on just these two verses today. We're going to talk about the first son's decision to leave. I'm going to suggest three reasons we might be tempted to leave the father's house. And then second, we'll talk about the father's decision to comply. So first, the son's decision to leave. I'll put it like this. Sometimes we want to get away from God. There's something in us, in all of us, that would rather be away from the Father. We rebel. We sin. We'd rather be on our own than accountable to Him. So why? I mean, that's the question, right? If it's good at the Father's house, why would the younger son want to leave? If, if we know that God loves us and we know that God cares for us and we know that God provides for us, why do we want to get away from him? It's one of the great questions of life, actually. There's something in us that wants to leave, like a moth drawn to a bright light. Sometimes we can't resist the urge just to ask for our inheritance and then take it and go. Why? I'm going to actually take us to another passage of the Bible, one that also involves leaving the Father's house. It's Genesis chapter 3. And it tells the story of Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. And I think there are a lot of parallels. Adam and Eve have it good in the garden. It's perfect. They're able to eat fruit from any tree save one. There's no guilt. There's no shame. They walk with God in the cool of the day. They're living in the Father's house. Probably more than any other humans in the history of the world. Living in the Father's house. And yet they left. They asked for their inheritance and went. So again, why? Why? And I think as we look at their story, we'll be able to see some of the things that we tell ourselves when we walk away from God. So for example, I believe Adam and Eve told themselves, 
God is holding out on me. I think we say this to ourselves. God is holding out on me. This is the beginning of the temptation. Genesis 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent, Satan, is more crafty than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The Bible tells us that the serpent was crafty. We see that in his first question. He says to the woman, Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. On its surface, it seems like an innocent enough question until you compare it to what God had actually said. God's precise words from Genesis 2, 16 and 17 were, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of that one, you will surely die. You see what the serpent has done here? He's completely twisted God's words around. God had given Adam and Eve free access to every single tree in the garden save one. But now the serpent comes along and suggests that God doesn't want them to eat from any tree. He's implying that God is a despot, that he's a rule crazy ogre who doesn't want Adam and Eve to enjoy anything good. And my guess is that's how the younger son felt. He had access to everything the father had. But his father also had rules for him. And those rules felt restrictive. It made him feel like he was missing out. For her part, Eve catches the serpent's mistake. Corrects him. Verse 2, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But notice that she leaves out the crucial word, any. The seeds of doubt have been planted, though an entire garden has been set before her. Now her focus is increasingly centered on the one tree which has been denied to her. And that's how temptation works. Instead of focusing on and celebrating the many opportunities and privileges God has opened up to us, we center in on something which God has told us we should not have. And the voice of temptation begins to whisper, God, God is such a killjoy. He never wants you to have any fun. Why is it every time you want to do something, God says it's wrong? If God really loved you, He'd let you do what you want to do. And so on. And soon all that we can think about are those things we know God does not approve of. We begin to think of God as an arbitrary dictator. We begin to resent Him. Nothing seems quite so desirable as that which we know we should not have. We long for it. We dwell on it. We think of nothing else. And then we start to tell ourselves things like, well, what's it going to hurt? That's what happens next in the garden, verses 3 and 4. Eve says to the serpent, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. And the serpent answered, you will not surely die. See, if the serpent is going to get Eve to disobey God, then he needs to convince her that the consequences aren't all that bad. Likewise, the road that leads us into sin requires us to believe that nothing truly bad is going to result. I'm sure the younger son thought nothing bad would come of what he did. He told himself that it was for the best. He needed to get out and spread his wings. He told himself, you know, you only live once. You might as well do it right. He told himself, you will not surely die. And there's so many ways we tell ourselves the same thing today. Nobody can tell me what to do. Everybody needs to choose their own path. You know, the only real sin is when you're not true to yourself. We think that there's no authority, that there's no right or wrong. We think we should be able to define for ourselves what is good. And so we say things like, well, if it feels right, how can it be wrong? We dismiss the idea that there will be any consequences for the decisions that we make. And yet, just because we think there should be no consequences, that doesn't mean that there won't be. You might not like gravity, but jump off your roof and you're in for a hard landing. 
Or again, we say to ourselves, it will be fun. The last thing the serpent says to Eve, verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Once again, the serpent approaches the tree from the standpoint that God is holding out on Adam and Eve. He convinces her that there's something really desirable about that forbidden fruit. He convinces her that if she only ate this fruit, she'd be so much wiser. He convinces her that she can be like God. The thing we want to do, it looks so desirable. It looks so good. It seems like if we had it, we'd be on top of the world. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Once she was convinced that the fruit was desirable, it was over. She truly believed that God was holding out on her, that she and her husband were missing out and they walked willfully into sin. And still today, the tempter's whole agenda is to get you to drool over the imagined excitement which God is keeping you from. Really, he's like a good fisherman. He carefully cuts his bait to make it attractive and appetizing. He puts it in the water and he makes it flutter and dance. He presents it in a way so that it appears there are no strings attached. He carefully hides the hook. And he whispers, oh, you'll feel so much better if you just snap at your wife instead of speaking to her in a reasonable tone of voice. He whispers, it's so much more fun to sleep with whomever you want instead of restricting yourself to one person. You'll be so much more popular if you just relax your standards and go along with the crowd. You'll be the envy of all your friends if you buy that car or that house or that boat or whatever. And time after time, we take the bait and the hook is set before we ever know it. Temptation becomes sin, and like Adam and Eve, we're reeled into the devil's boat. And we walk away from the Father's house. And in retrospect, it never makes sense. We have it good in the Father's house, and yet sometimes we want to get away. We listen to the voice of temptation. We convince ourselves we'd be better on our own. We tell God we want out. And so here's the second thing we need to see from the beginning of Jesus' story. Sometimes God allows us to go. Luke 15, 12. So the Father divided His property between them. The younger son comes with this outlandish, insulting request. And the father does what he asks. He splits his inheritance between his two sons. Here's one of the most fascinating things for us to know about God. Just like the father in the story, he will let us walk away. It's not that he likes it when we do. And it's not that he couldn't do something to stop us. But God is a God who loves us. And he wants us to love him in return. And a world in which love is truly possible must also be a world in which non-love is possible. In other words, God has given us a choice. He hasn't just designed us and programmed us so that we have no choice but to love him, if that were the case, it wouldn't really be love. It'd be, we'd just be following the way we'd been programmed. We'd be like puppets on a string. No, God's created a world in which we're free to love him or not. And in his sovereignty, mysteriously, in a way that we can never surprise him, he allows us to choose for or against him. And when we decide that we'd rather walk away from the Father's house, He lets us go. So if you've ever looked back on your life and you said, why did God let me do that? 
Why didn't he stop me? Why didn't he do something to keep me from making that terrible decision? This is why. Because he loves us. And so if we want to go, he lets us. God is a God who allows us to choose him or to choose to leave him. And a lot of us, at one time or another, maybe right now, have said one of those things. You know, God, God is holding out on me. What's it going to hurt? Oh, it'll be fun. We've said one of those things, and we've walked away. It starts off as a little request, a little control, a little harmless pleasure. You're not trying to tell God that he has no place in your life. You just want to try it this one time. You're not trying to tell God that he's not number one in your life, but can't, can't there be a close second? You're not trying to tell God he was wrong about marriage, but don't you deserve to be happy? You're not trying to tell God that you want nothing to do with him, but it's, it's just silly to give money to the church when, when your friends have such nice things. We may not intend to tell God we wish he was dead, But that's exactly what we end up saying. We know this story of Jesus is the parable of the prodigal son. I'm guessing most of us assume that word prodigal means something like wayward or rebellious. We associate that word prodigal with lost. But actually, the word prodigal means this. Recklessly extravagant. The word prodigal means to spend until you have nothing left. And the story has that name, obviously, because that's what the younger son does. He takes his share of the inheritance, and then he goes and he spends it until there's nothing left. He's recklessly extravagant. He's reckless with his money. But I'd like to suggest to you that that word is also a pretty good description of the father in this story. The father is also recklessly extravagant, isn't he? First of all, in his decision to honor the younger son's request. He didn't have to. And even more so in his decision to welcome his rebellious son back home. He is a prodigal father. And Timothy Keller has a book about this parable that he's entitled, The Prodigal God. Because really, the whole point of the story is to show us how recklessly extravagant God is with his love. Keller writes, Jesus is showing us the God of great expenditure, who is nothing if not prodigal toward us, his children. God's reckless grace is our greatest hope. It's a life-changing experience. God shows his prodigal love towards us in this way. If we want to walk away, he will let us. But more than that, when we come back, he's there to welcome us with open arms. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I'm certain we see ourselves in this young man. That all of us can go back to decisions we've made, points in our life where we've walked away from You, turned our back on You, wished You were not there. Oh God, forgive us for that. Forgive us of the arrogance that thinks we can do better. Like Adam and Eve, Lord, it's so easy to be tempted away from You. But thank You, Lord, that You are a God of love, a God of recklessly extravagant love. 
And as we uh, work through this great story, Lord, help us always to remember that you're just waiting, just waiting to receive us home with open arms. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for being flexible with our two-hour late start uh, this morning. We do still have the meal. The meal is uh, here and been prepared, so hang around if you don't have dinner, supper, lunch plans, um, and, and come and join us uh, for that at the harbor end. As you go, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go before you to guide you, above you to watch over you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to lift you up. May he go beside you to befriend you. And most of all, may he go within you to give you his peace. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.